Okay, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to start the open the meeting and I'm going to read the script. And if at the end of the script we don't have uh, Dr. Singh and Dr. Jacoby, you will be please uh, voting tonight. So, good evening. Tonight is the uh, uh, remote meeting of the Board of Health. This uh, meeting is being conducted remotely, <laughs> consistent with the Governor Baker's order of March 12, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth and the local state of emergency as declared by uh, the Acton Board of Health due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate transmission of the virus, um, Board of Selectmen have suspended all public gatherings and in accordance with the governor's order, the meetings of the public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely, which is what we're doing tonight. So uh, the governor's order says that we can meet remotely as long as reasonable public access is provided and the public can follow along with the deliberations and the votes of the meeting. Uh, this meeting is being carried on the phone and on Zoom. And um, uh, the public uh, is entitled to um, view the meeting and listen to the deliberations. We uh, typically take public comment at the end of discussion, of board discussion on a particular motion, and that would be our intention tonight. If you wish to comment, please indicate to the moderator that you wish to by either clicking a raise your hand button, or I believe there's instructions for um, telephone participants on how to do that. And just uh, for your awareness, tonight's meeting is in fact being recorded and um, because of the remote format, most votes will be taken by roll call. If you wish to speak during a meeting, please um, announce who you are and uh, what it is that you'd like to address. And I will try to call on you. And please wait until it's your turn to talk. And then uh, please uh, encourage you to provide us your input. Um, so that's it. I think I've read the script. Um, I do not see Dr. Singh online. So Dr. Jacoby, please uh, step in. And I would like to begin with tonight's agenda, which I will pull up in just one second here. There it is. So as usual, the first uh, item on the agenda is talking about the global pandemic and getting an update from our health director, Ms. Cheryl Ball and um, usually followed by an update from our director of the Acton Nursing Service. And in that case, Heather, uh, excuse me, not, not Heather, Cheryl, <laughs> Heather is second. Um, Cheryl, please, uh, please bring us up to date. Okay, so just so you know, Heather was off today, so I'll be filling in as her as well. Um, so I have an update for that. Um, so um, I guess I'll start with, um, you know, some of the notifications that you may have seen. So um, I know that um, you all got notified of a positive COVID case in the schools. So I just wanted to chat about that. So the, um, the, the school district worked with both Heather and myself to um, get out a letter. Um, that letter, there's, they have three different letters. So one letter would be a confirmation of a positive case. Um, and notifying you that you're a close contact. Another, case, another letter they have would be your po um, there was a positive case, all families um, within the school district are notified, um, but they're not a close contact. And then the third letter is similar to the second one. There's a positive case in the school, wow. all families are notified, um, they're not a close contact, but the student was not in school. So um, I just wanted to, to tell you about all those. Um, we've uh, had one positive case in this. I mean, we've had a couple of positive cases in the school, but one that we've only had to contact trace because the student wasn't in school for the others. So um, I just wanted to, to throw that out there and let you know um, what's going on with that because I know um, that was, uh, there was discussion about that among some board members. So um, Cheryl, can yeah. I just stop you right there and just ask uh, members of the board, does anyone have any questions or comments on that particular communication or, or incident? I know it, um, it generated some, some interest. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone unmute, so I think we're good. Thank you. Okay, and then the second one has to do with the complaint that you guys might have seen regarding uh, school activities. 
Um, so I just wanted to, to follow up on that and let you know that I conducted an inspection. Um, I've been chatting with the athletic director um, weekly now. And, um, you know, he's given me his assurance that he's spending the day, you know, walking miles just to uh, make sure that this, the sports teams are all practicing social distancing and or face covering. Um, when I did my inspection, I saw quite a few sport activities ongoing and they were all either social distancing or wearing their face coverings. And some were even uh, social distancing and kept their face coverings on. So I was happy to see that. And then I actually had a conversation with the school resource officer um, and he, he promised me that he would check um, on a, you know, pretty much on a daily basis whenever he's working, just to make sure that those um, activities are adhering to the guidelines. But from what I saw it was, so I just wanted to give you an update on that um, as well. Um, so we, we entered as of today, phase three, step two. Um, so we were um, eligible to enter step two because um, we're in a, we're a green community. So anybody, any state, city or town that's um, not identified as a high risk, or it would, which would be a red community, um, could enter into state, uh, phase three, step two. So this includes uh, ro uh, bowling alleys, trampolines, roller skating, um, fitness centers have increased from 40 to 50%. Um, the, the gatherings have, have upped a little bit for the amount of people and batting cages are allowed to be open. So um, the only thing that's pretty much still closed as far as those kind of activities would be ball pits. Um, and currently our low risk states have dwindled a little bit since the last time we talked. And right now it's Connecticut, District of Columbia, um, New Hampshire, uh, New York, Vermont, and I'm missing one. Is it Maine? Maine. I'm sorry, Maine. Yeah, good, good catch. Um, so those what are those are what our low risk states are. Um, we, oh, um, I uh, just out of something out of curiosity, and I emailed it to you, Bill. Um, but there, uh, the town's doing a public forum um, on October 15th to at 7 p.m. and it's being done via Zoom to um, discuss drive-throughs in Acton. <laughs> So considering that we chatted about that um, at a previous meeting when the pandemic hit, um, I thought it would be um, helpful for you to know that. The Actually, I was going to suggest to the board when uh, at some point, maybe this is a good time. We had previously recommended that to the selectmen uh, based on the CDC's guidance. And uh, so question would be for the board, do we want to recommend it as part of this meeting at least? I mean, we don't have to be on the meeting, but we could send in a recommendation that just says the Board of Health recommends it because, you know, no contact, physical barrier, that sort of um, idea, you know, separation distance, so forth, uh, in keeping with what the CDC said. So I'll, I'll throw that out there. I mean, I guess I would be of the, of the inclination that it, to me, it makes sense. It's a health uh, protective measure. Um, it has obviously lots of other consequences, you know, traffic, economics, and so forth. But from a health perspective, it seems like it's probably um, during a pandemic a good thing to do. This but is a, this is drive-through for what products? Well, in particular, what I was thinking of is for the pharmacies, so that you don't have to go into the store and then you know wait online and then you know have the all the other associated things of people being near you as well as, um, you know, touching uh, surfaces that have been touched by many people, such as door handles and so forth. Is, is, is that what's being discussed or is it broader than that? It, I don't, I should say, I really don't know Dr. Bill, but I understand it's broader than that. So it would include things like banks or um, McDonald's or Burger King, so forth, okay. which again, I would suggest is for Burger King and McDonald's, probably a good idea. What about liquor stores? You know, except in Texas, I've never seen a drive-through like drive-through liquor store. But but maybe <laughs> there have been ones in Massachusetts, Bill. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I just don't get around enough, Mark. <laughs> I've seen them in North Carolina. 
<laughs> well, I, I guess we should be promoting non-contact exterior type delivery. So if it would be a drive-through or if it would be as one of the other pharmacies did where they bring it out to you. Um, so, I mean, I don't think we necessarily have to promote drive-through, but I think uh, exterior delivery, non-contact um, and minimal contact is certainly what we should be going for. I think other than that, we should just stay out of the zoning free. Yeah, I think right. that's good advice, Mark. Yeah, so I guess what I would say is that uh, I, I, my proposal and just what I'm looking for feedback on is, you know, our, our answer should be, we're in favor of it from a health perspective, you know, period. Is that? I think it's not just drive through. I think the point is whether it be drive through or non contact exterior or remote delivery or whatever, but minimizing the contacts more outside is what we're in favor of. But, you know, as far as whether it's drive through or not, I think that that's, we just stay out of the fray. It's just that's the policy for health perspective. Everything else is up to the others, that we shouldn't be meddling in other um, issues like that. That's for the voters and the town to decide. Okay, so if, um, if I was to draft a letter for the board's uh, consent that just said something about we support uh, things that provide non-contact or minimal contact delivery of goods and services, period, mm -hmm. might that be acceptable? Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think I would just add ex you know, exterior as well. Okay. All right. I'll make a note of that. All right. Then I'll, uh, I'll maybe do that. I don't know if uh, maybe uh, Cheryl, I could ask you to just circulate it to the board and get comments. And if there's general consensus and I'll, um, I'll go ahead and ask that it be issued on the board's behalf. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right, and um, so I have a couple more things. So um, we had our second household hazardous waste day um, on Thursday evening, October 1st, and um, didn't expect a big crowd, but we serviced 118 cars. So 118 cars with the 404 that we had at the previous Saturday, or a couple weeks ago Saturday. Um, it's the most cars we've ever serviced, but uh, yeah, as you all know, this was the first one we had um, this year. So. It, you know, I think it, it the factor was, um, you know, we canceled the one in the spring and, and people have been home to, to clean out their areas. So um, very busy, um, lots of good stuff. So um, I'm, I'm glad we were able to do that. So, um, and then I have two more things. Um, so there is a, um, I, I think you all would have, I should have got the email, but there is a um, PFAS in Acton Water um, meeting on October 14th from 7 to 8 uh, 30 p.m. and that's going to be done via Zoom. Um, I did put that information in the extra in the extra information folder in your packet so if you're interested in that I just wanted to um, let you know that that was happening. Um, and then the last thing is that I promised you an update on the remote learning um, that we approved at the last meeting so so far, we still only have the two plans that, um, that you all saw um, when, at our last meeting. Um, and one of them, uh, Teamworks, has actually moved forward and been approved by the um, EEC. Um, and surprisingly, um, it was sent in and it was approved the next day. So I, I thought it would be quite a process, but... Um, so they're um, either up and running or close to being running. We've conducted all the inspections. Um, all the inspections except for one have been done for Act and Recreation. Um, so they are hoping to get that soon and getting their packets submitted to the EEC for approval. But that's where we're at. I mean, it seemed like we were going to get a lot of them, but um, we didn't. Um, we, only, we still only have received the two. And I think that's all I have. Okay. Well, thank you, Cheryl. Hello. Remember, you're a twin tonight. Oh, yeah. Okay. So playing the part of Heather. <laughs> um, we um, unfortunately have gone up a little bit. So um, I think I mentioned to you that, or maybe I forgot, but the state metrics um, that comes out on Wednesdays, um, we're, we're in the green. Um, so we've gone from the lowest one of gray to green. Um, we do have 211 positive cases. 
uh, four that are active in isolation, 186 recovered, and 21 fatalities. Um, so that's, that's all I had for Heather. Um, she asked me to talk about the school, which I did in my update. So I don't know if you guys have any questions. Yeah, I had a any question. Board members? I had yes. a question, Joe. Just maybe informational. The, N, the NFL is saying that if you, have, if you test positive, have no symptoms, but you test negative, if you have two negatives within five days, you're good uh, to go and participate. Does that sound right? So honestly, I've been shaking my head at the fact that the Patriots are playing tonight because I don't understand how they um, – you know, we're able to do that without identifying any of those other players as contacts. So um, I don't know. I'll have to look into that. I have not seen that guidance ne and neither has Heather. We chatted about that this morning. Cause, cause what the NFL is saying is if you have two negatives within five days and then you can play. Haven't seen that Dr. Dakota. Okay. Yeah, it, it gets interesting. Like, so have people that have already had COVID, but now are negative, do they not have to wear a mask? Because, you know, they're not infectious and they can't be infected. Um, I don't think anyone's prepared to go there quite yet, but there's a lot of, we still don't know. Mr. Connaby? I said they could also possibly be reinfected. So I mean, we have a lot we don't know. But I guess the, the questions for our department are, you know, are there any discerning or any troubling trends, any issues with personnel or PPE or anything like that right now? Um, so PPEs, we, we had a meeting um, this morning and uh, we're good with our supply. Um, you know, we, we, it's still flowing in. Um, you know, we keep hearing that it's going to dry up, but so far so good with the PPEs. Um, no trends really, just the ones that Heather's mentioned before either college students or uh, people traveling is, is the only trends that we've seen so far. Thank you. Any other questions from members of the board? Any questions from members of the public? Uh, hold on, I'm playing the part of three people today. No. All right. Well, very good. Well, in that case, uh, thank you very much, Cheryl. Oh, Mr. Economy? Yep. I guess the other question is, any other board actions with the re revised guidance or regarding entering uh, phase three, part two? Um, no, there's nothing. Um, I mean, the bowling alley is the only thing that we have that was really within that. And um, there's nothing that needs board action. Cheryl, did you just kill your screen? The um, what trying, you were sharing? Okay. I'm trying to find the Halloween thing. <laughs> ah, got it. Okay. Just takes me a minute. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not very good at this. You never knew it was going to be a job requirement. To be a master of Zoom. No, and I know there's probably an easier way to do this, but um, yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, can you see that? Yes. All right, so um, this was guidance that we received from um, the state today. Um, actually, I think it was a couple days ago. Um, so Given that Halloween, our next meeting is going to be pretty quick for Halloween. I thought it would be a good idea that we decide tonight um, about Halloween. I don't know if anybody has any, you know, strong feelings one way or the other. Um, but basically, the guidance is to um, allow trick-or-treating with guidelines. So here are some guidelines that you can see in the middle of your screen you know, requiring the physical, uh, the six feet of uh, social distancing, avoiding large groups or clusters, make sure that you have a, a face covering, 
uh, carry hand sanitizer, wash your hands, and don't participate if you're not feeling well. That would be including people passing out candy and um, and those that would be receiving it. So, um, you know, and they're also given guidelines for people passing out to wash their hands before they do it, uh, considering lining up prepackaged treat bags um, at the end of the driveway. Um, and then they should also have a mask on and, and maintain the six feet of distance from any trick-or-treaters. Which, which can get difficult, but um, I think there's a lot of creative ideas out there. I'm probably all seen the tubing where you send it down a six foot um, PVC pipe um, right into the child's uh, waiting basket. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of people that are considering putting out candy at a table at the end of their um, driveway and then you know setting them all up and then when they're gone, disinfecting and replacing. So. Um, that's another option there. So I just wanted to run, run it by all of you to see what your uh, thinking is on this. And um, we need to give this guidance to the, the town manager um, uh, in the near future. So I'm thinking about something just following these guidelines here that we have in front of you um, and holding the, uh, the event. I, I have a feeling that some people will not participate um, and that's their choice and there's there's also what I can put out in the guidelines I can put out creative ideas to for your children um, for not participating so some of the suggestions would be like um, uh, uh, pumpkin carving or uh, movie night or or something like that to you know still let your children feel like they're participating in an event but um, having it done safely so that's, that's all I have about it. I just would like to know what you guys are thinking. Okay, well, thank you. I'll just offer my thoughts and then I'll ask um, other members to please chime in. I think your guide, guideline is fine. I actually think in some ways it's probably beneficial to allow um, trick-or-treating. This is just my personal view because if we can get the parents and everyone to sort of uh, you know reinforce or you know, emphasize the guidelines. I think it's a good uh, learning experience for the uh, young people that they realize that even in their, uh, I'll say, uh, play or social activities, you know, they, during a pandemic, they need to modify their, their approach a little bit and they can get a chance to practice it. And they might even think that wearing a mask as part of their costume is fun. And so hopefully uh, we can make it a, a little bit of a reinforcement of the behaviors we'd like to see as well as allowing them to uh, to enjoy a, a tradition. So that's my uh, opinion, but I'd very much like to hear from other members of the board. Joanne? Yeah, um, I agree with you. And, um, you know, the two key factors as well as, you know, most of the interaction is outside, whether it's um, at the end of the driveway or even at the door. Um, so um, I feel like there's minimal risk provided everybody's wearing masks and, and, you know, on a sort of a social benefit of, you know, allowing the kids to have some sort of fun. Um, you know, I, I think they've all been challenged with the start of the school year um, and it'd be nice to have almost a normal holiday um, and do it safely. Thank you, Joanne. Other uh, other members? Mark. Yeah, it, it sounds like a lot of these are great ideas. I have a little bit of concern about putting things out at the end of the driveway with the animals and just a whole bunch of stuff like that. But I guess as long as they're wearing masks and washing their hands and sanitizing, that sounds good. I guess I would probably also try to emphasize that all the treats should be prepackaged and sealed. So, you know, you don't have an issue with that. And then, you know, maybe just try to, you know, make sure that you're not have groups of kids all going together, try to encourage smaller, you know, family units to go out rather than you know, used to see the group of, you know, a couple dozen teenagers together. So it's a modified trick or treat, but especially for the little kids. I mean, watching a movie is not the same as a chocolate high. So I think we need to uh, 
<laughs> yeah, the good old days. So, I, yeah, I mean, let them have some fun. I mean, they're going to school, but I think you're right. You know, try to do it safely, be creative, and let's see what we can do to support a little bit of fun for the kids. Great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Jacoby, I see you're unmuted. Yeah. Um, is there any concern, do we think, um, about all those little hands going into one basket and pulling things out? I mean, we're trying you know, to eliminate things like that where a lot of hands go into the same thing. I, mean, I guess you could, uh, one way to solve it is you could ask the candy hander to wear gloves and then, you know, pick the candy and toss it into the kid's bag. I think what he's suggesting is that we have like prepackaged like little containers or something else. You're not reaching into the same container and you're, it's spread out outside. So that's part of being creative to make sure you don't have that communal activity touching the same things. And I think that's, that's what, what I was about. getting at. Yes. Yeah. So I think you need to modify the way it's being delivered. You know, whether you want to have, you know, <laughs> some tube or throw it or a spaced out thing. I mean, I'm sure people can get great creative, a robot, a drone, whatever their thoughts, but uh, get the candy to them safely, I guess is the bottom line and make sure they wash their hands after handling the things. Good points. Other comments? Going once, going twice. Okay, I'm going to say that it sounds like the Board of Health is in general in favor of trick or treat with the guidelines um, and just encourage people to uh, use, their, use their heads and think safely and try to come up with creative and safe ways to both uh, outfit their children and <clears throat> help their children have the proper behaviors while out on Halloween night and to um, practice safe candy handling uh, themselves. Okay. If any, anyone objects, this would be the right time. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I think there's, there's our recommendation for the town manager. Thank you. Okay. What do we have next? Is it? Uh, the twin school, um, the aquifer special permit. So, um, I do have some people on the call that uh, may want to talk, so, but I thought I'd give uh, a little update first. Um, so uh, tonight we have the proposed twin school at Douglas and Gates before you for the aquifer special permit. Um, but I do want to give you an update of, of the timeline for where they stand right now um, for um, the other components that you've already approved. So um, the tank schedule um, looks like it's gonna be delivered late November uh, with installation in December. Um, and then the um, leaching field is not scheduled to start till the spring of 2021. So I just wanted to give you an update on that. Um, there are proposed conditions that were placed in your packet. Um, they were modified today um, for number five, which is the condition in red that you can see here. Um, so um, these have been shared with both the engineer and the um, schools um, and they, in, they are in agreement with all these conditions except for one. Um, so the one that they um, would like to discuss tonight is um, the no floor drains. Um, so you know as you know there's uh, clear guidance in, um, in uh, article 16 that says that floor drains aren't allowed. Um, they have multiple areas where they were looking to install the floor drains um, in the kitchen, the bathrooms, and then the one in the work area. So the condition that we have on here says that um, if you want floor drains, they have to pretty much go to a tight, uh, be directed to a tight tank. It's really not conducive for there it's fine for the work area that they want to have a floor drain in because you know they don't know what you know chemicals they may be working on in there so they've agreed to that one um, but the ones in the bathroom in the kitchen um, they would like to discuss so just so you know too I did have a conversation with my building commissioner um, and he he told me that 
uh, per the sta uh, state plumbing uh, code, they would need to be um, in those areas that we just talked about, um, or they would need to get, um, they would have to go to the uh, State Plumbing Board of Appeals to not have them. Um, and that the drains are there for a sanitary reason. Um, so, you know, I'm just giving you a little bit of information that I have. Um, and then I, I let, I think it's um, Emily that wants to talk. If whoever wants to talk wants to raise your hand, I can let you talk once the board's ready. Okay, well, thank you, Cheryl. I just have a quick question you'd know the answer to immediately. The kitchens that you inspect, do they have floor drains? You know, I, I, I've never noticed, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, the, the Article 16 speaks to Zone 1, 2, and 3. So if, this, if the facility weren't in those, um, those zones, then it wouldn't be an issue. Like, they could e easily have the floor drain. But um, Article 16 is what says, uh, what states you can have them. Are they in the existing schools? I'm not sure if they're in the existing schools. Maybe the school can probably talk to that. I, I, I don't recall, I don't ever remember looking for them. Okay, thank you. Well then, sure, if someone from the schools or the um, engineering or architectural firm would like to um, fill us in on the issue, that would be great. Yeah, so I'm gonna let Emily Grant's staff, Bryce, talk the architect for the project. Should be able to go ahead, Emily. Uh, good evening, thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, yes, yeah, so I represent uh, the acton Boxborough Regional School District. My name is Emily Grandstaff Rice. I'm the architect for the project. Uh, I have had a conversation with Cheryl regarding this. Let me address, I guess, the two questions that were just brought up. Yes, uh, kitchens typically do have floor drains. Um, and I can talk specifically about some of the provisions that we're planning to have in this one. And yes, the existing schools do have floor drains. So I think the issue is, you know, we want to do the right thing. Um, but where, we're, where we have some confusion is in condition number 16, and I'll just read it out loud. Floor drains are not permitted except for floor drains, which are connected to a tight tank with monitoring system and maintenance plan as approved with conditions by the health division. All non-sanitary waste shall be directed to the tight tank. And I think where, where I think we just want to have a discussion is the difference between sanitary waste versus non-sanitary waste. Um, and that... Cheryl's absolutely right. All of the floor drains, and there's only two um, because there's two large bathrooms, toilet facilities accessible to the public, which have two or more toilets or urinals, or two or more thereof in combination, shall provide a floor drain equipped with an automatic trap priming device and a valve hose connection equipped with a black backflow preventer. The hose connection is for the purpose of floor cleaning in the toilet facility. So that's plumbing code for any toilet facility where you have more than two toilets. Could you tell uh, what site that is? Where'd you get that, please? Yes, that's 248 CMR 10.10. .10. It's Article N. You 10 point what? I mean, I'm, we're in the plumbing code. I was just looking at it. Yeah, it's 10.10. 10.10. .10. 10 .10. Article N as in Nathan? Yeah. Ms. Uh, Grandstaff Rice, please continue. I'm sure Mark just wants to get the exact wording, but but I, um, I certainly take your point, which is the plumbing yeah. code requires it for a bathroom. Yeah, so then we have a couple other conditions. Um, we do have a floor drain in the mechanical room and that is to prevent uh, in case there is equipment failure. Uh, and so that is a best practice. Uh, we also have um, floor sinks in the, in the kitchen. And I think this is one of those things where we just need clarification because by floor drain, does that also include mop sinks and floor sinks? And we have one shower receptacle because there's a staff shower. Uh, and in the case of the kitchen, the floor sinks are actually under elevated sinks to prevent, um, uh, they're under the sinks uh, for any prevention of backflow or overflow of the sinks above them. We have floor drains in the kitchen. They're actually grates. And those floor drains are designed to go into the grease inceptor. And the inceptor is connected to the septic system. 
So that's a little bit of a special connection because you know that that's a that's a health department thing as well to make sure that we have the right grease acceptor. And then um, we do have a drain in a water heater room. And again, that's in case of equipment failure, in case there's a flood, uh, so that it does not flood the building. So I think really the, the conversation for us is um, we do have one in the equipment storage room. We completely understand there could be chemicals and we did have a tight tank design for that area. I guess the question is, can you be more specific about what sanitary and non-sanitary waste and how that applies to the specific condition? Okay, well, uh, thank you. And uh, I totally appreciate your points. Uh, let me just offer a little bit of a background on, um, on that particular article. I, I think the, um, the non-sanitary and sanitary might be slightly um, inartfully phrased, but I, but I believe it means that, um, you know, toilets and so forth should, which are considered sanitary waste, would be directed to the, um, the septic system. And then anything that's not, say, a toilet or sink would be directed to the tight tank. Um, that, I think that's what it was meant to convey. But, uh, but the background is, you know, Acton is, um, has had a super fun site at WR Grace. Um, we've We've had a few other struggles in town with um, highly polluted sites. Uh, Pencil Factory comes to mind. There's a, there's several others, and the genesis of the floor drain thing was that um, whereas 99.9 percent .9 of the time it'll just be used for the purpose you say for mopping the floor at the end of the day to clean up the kitchen, it's when somebody makes a mistake and they drop something or something tips over and it hits the floor drain and it's instantly in the groundwater. And now we have a huge problem. Um, and so the intent of Article 16 was to prevent that from happening because you know the town has kind of suffered from that um, problem of having our, our groundwater polluted with something, I'll assume in most cases unintentionally. <laughs> and um, so that was, that's the purpose for it. Now, given that, you know, we're very sensitive in the town to having our groundwater, because we drink it, um, polluted and, you know, the struggles we've had trying to clean up sites that got polluted, you know, ultimately, I think where the board is coming from, just, we just like assurance that that's not going to happen. Um, and if there's a reasonable way to do that, I, I will tell you at least personally, I think be okay with it. And perhaps the other members of the board would as well. Um, so th thank you for bringing it to our attention, but, and, and I get it in the water heater room. This is again, just my personal opinion, but in the water heater room, if you're not storing anything else in there, I, I guess the only thing that would go into the drain is hot water um, or cold water, <laughs> depending. Uh, but the, the issue of like, say a bathroom, say, and I'll just, I'm just throwing this out as an example. Say you have a, a pail or a bucket or a drum of, of bathroom floor cleaning uh, material and it tips over. And so it all hits the septic system at the same time. You know, how could we manage something like that? So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be an issue. Um, anyway, I'm, I've offered my opinion, perhaps, um, other members of the board would care to, uh, Mr. Conaby? Sure, I mean, I think what they're trying to say about the sanitary and non-sanitary is a good issue to discuss because I mean, really the point of the sanitary, the non-sanitary is any waste that would be prohibited from being discharged to the septic system would be the things that we're most concerned about. So, you know, Water, I mean, obviously is not, would be discharged. I mean, it's, it would be able to be, it's part of the sanitary waste because that's where it's going. But I think we need to come back to a few other issues. I mean, the, you know, the concern about the bathrooms is a good one where it has it in the state uh, plumbing code for doing it. But I think we could work with them and put covers on the floor drain so you wouldn't inadvertently put stuff down. And then when they're doing the maintenance operation, they could open up the floor drains to do that. As far as the water heater, I, mean, I think there's better practices using water shutoffs with uh, water alarms and, or using an indirect rather than a floor drain. So it's not quite so easy to just dump something down the drain in a mechanical space. 
So I think the concern about you know running water causing a uh, a flood or damage is a good concern, but I think there's better practices to deal with that. Um, as far as the mechanical room, it sounds like they're in agreement with that. Um, particularly if they have an emergency eye wash and shower, going to a tight tank is a great solution. But I think I'll defer to Cheryl about the uh, kitchen areas. But I mean, in some cases, what we really don't want is everything just kind of being mopped to the center floor drain and down the drain. And, you know, are they going to put, you know, grates and uh, strainers and things on them so you're not clogging things up? I mean, there's a whole bunch of issues that come up with that. But going to the grease trap and then to the uh, septic system, I think that's not what I think this floor drain is uh, designed to do. Like you said, it really was the genesis of worrying about the groundwater and having issues of where the floor drains have contaminated things. So I guess we can push back a lot of this stuff to the department to be resolved. But in general, I think if it's not a bathroom where required, try to find ways not to have floor drains, use indirect, use shutoffs. Uh, in the kitchen, I think that answers the question on the grease, uh, but I'm not sure if there's other questions. Okay, thank you, Mark. Other members of the board, and questions or comments? All right, well, I'll just offer, Mark, I mean, I appreciate the suggestions. I think uh, covering the floor drains when not in use is a great idea that could uh, potentially um, help a lot with the concern about accidental discharge of, of something. Um, and I would assume that's a relatively straightforward thing to do as, and the water heater thing. Yeah. I, I've, I've typically seen those drain to the outside, but perhaps where your, um, where your water heater room is located, it's not convenient to do that. They, they can um, look, I mean, a lot of times they just put a pan and then under the water heater where, because the water heaters are up on a pad, and then if there's any water coming out of that, so there's a leak, then it would obviously kick off a water alarm of a leak. So you wouldn't have it just draining to the floor drain. And they wouldn't want to be wasting the water and having it you know, overflow with the septic anyways. So you know, putting a containment pan on the pad for the hot water heaters. And then if it bursts, you'd have uh, just any commercial available valves that would trigger. So you wouldn't just be running inadvertently. So there's a bunch of different things, I guess. I would push it back to let the department work on it, but there's better practices than just putting a floor drain. Well, in a tight tank, because that's expensive and then you have to monitor it and so forth. Yeah, I mean, obviously the best case is you don't have those situations, but obviously they're planning for the contingency, which is good um, from an insurance, from a damage and everything else. But I guess the point is that should, we can probably say that the floor drains are not permitted except as you know, allowed by the department with conditions and approval. Okay, thank you. Ms. Uh, Grandstaff Rice, should, do you have any reaction or comments to the discussion? No, I, I think that's fair. Our, our concern is obviously best practices. And I do wanna note that we are planning to have grates in the kitchen, um, that's already planned. Um, so so thank you for, for pointing that out. Um, we're happy to work with the Board of Health agents to, to work this through. Okay, great. Then I think, Charlie, you just got another delegation. Thank you. Did you uh, catch Mark's suggested wording that, you know, uh, floor drains are not except as, you know? I did. Okay, very good. So uh, if I just, to be able to uh, conclude this issue, Ms. Grant is it is it your um, position that the schools would find that change acceptable and yes yeah um including i i wrote down all the suggestions including indirects um shutoffs covers we can we can look at all the uh, options and work with the board of health agents okay great thank you so in that case um i'll ask for comments from members of the uh, board are we of uh, a view that this is acceptable, not acceptable with changes or not acceptable. Ms. Bassetta. Um, I find it accept acceptable. I mean, it sounds like everybody's trying to come to a reasonable solution that protects uh, our groundwater. So um, yes, I, it sounds reasonable to me. Okay, thank you. Other members? 
Dr. Bill. Yes, uh, I also think it's a reasonable approach. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dr. Jacoby. Uh, yes, I think it's acceptable. Um, I just had a question though, was, does this involve multiple tight tanks or does everything go into one tight tank? Just for my information. Um, Ms. Grandstaff Rice might be able to address that, but it's possible the tight tank might go away based on the discussion. No, we will still have a tight tank um, because we do have an equipment room that we think it is important for us to contain that. I think the issue is um, if there's one tight tank, given the footprint of the building, that's quite complicated to, to bring many things to it. So if we've got distributed bathrooms, that would require multiple tight tanks. And, and I think that's where, that's where our conversation, that's where our concern came from is really the, the, the magnitude. So I think we, we can find an acceptable solution, understanding um, the concerns that you have, but we still will have one tight tank regardless. Okay, thank you. That answer your question, Dr. Jacoby? Yes, it does. Thank you. Other questions or comments from members of the board? Are there any questions from members of the public, Cheryl? No, there's not. Very good. In that case, um, members, or is anyone prepared to make a motion? Don't make me call on somebody. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Gotterby, please. Yeah, I think that would be fine. I mean, this is the same, essentially similar conditions to what the fire station had and other public facilities. So I guess the point is I would make a motion that we grant the uh, the permit with the conditions as noted as amended. Uh, okay, thank you. Is there a second? I'll Ms. second B it. Thank you, Ms. Bassetta. We have a motion made and seconded. Um, is there further discussion? Dr. Taylor, you were just prepared to vote, weren't you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, in that case, and the, all members in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, aye. Very good. Aye. Thank you, Dr. Jacoby. And I also say aye. I believe the motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Ms. Grandstaff Rice. Appreciate your uh, your time and and uh, presenting it, you know, uh, in a very, uh, very understandable way. Thank you as well. Good night. Good night. Okay, that brings us now to um, a discussion of amendments to Article Nine. So, um, at a previous meeting, um, we had discussed doing this, and I apologize. It took me a bit of time to to get this. So, what I wanted to do tonight was discuss the changes um, that we've outlined in red. Um, and then what we'll have to do is this is only discussion only tonight because I need to schedule this for a public hearing for an official vote and um, notify um, some people that we're having this. So um, like I said, discussion only, um, but the conditions that I've um, that modified are all in red right here. And this is only to help, um, you know, with uh, the geothermal wells that we're seeing and, um, you know, just to add some language in there to, to help with those. Okay. Well, thank you, Cheryl. Um, and I do appreciate it. And yes, it is something that we asked for. I'll, I'll just offer my comment after reading this, um, parsing through it, which is it, it almost, it makes sense to me that we're trying to sort of shoehorn this in with the irrigation wells because that's the closest similar thing but I wonder if it wouldn't just make sense to make it its own category of uh, geothermal wells. You can, you can copy the language of the irrigation wells to a large extent, but just add an, you know, a separate subparagraph under whichever paragraph the irrigation wells comes under, make it its own, its own subparagraph. Because I, I'm just concerned as, as you know, time goes on and, and issues come up with irrigation wells or geothermal wells, their their similarities will start to diverge and then you know the language will get even more and more contorted and this way we can just make a clean distinction now and um so that would that would be a suggestion okay i can i can do that um i should, probably should have noted that these changes are reflective on conditions that the boards voted in the past so i pulled those from previous board conditions so 
just wanted to throw that out there as well. Okay. No, I, I mean, the, the uh, restrictions or um, content, I didn't really have an argument with. It just seemed like they were, it, it was trying to marry, you know, together two things that, you know, may not make a perfect, uh, perfect union. So, okay. uh, but that's just my comment. Mark, you have a comment? Yeah, I think, I mean, the wells are, well is a well, depending what it's used for. You're still drilling it, registering everything else. So I'm less concerned about that, but certainly breaking it out is not an issue. It just makes it a little bit more redundant. But I guess looking at it, when I just started reading it, I think we need to probably start with changing the title of Article 9. It's like minimum uh, standards uh, for wells and for public and semi-public water supplies because I think we either we need to say it's because it's obviously irrigation and geothermal are not really water supply they're kind of a little bit different and I think that's kind of maybe what you're saying so I'm not sure whether we just have a whole different set of well regulations 9b or something or whether we just have this be all encompassing because most um most water supplies, you know, whether being used for geothermal, for irrigation, or for drinking, they all have to meet a lot of these requirements. So I guess I throw that out to think about. Okay, thank you. Any other members' comments? Is there a Talk. difference between a well for drinking water and a well for irrigation? <laughs> I hesitate to answer that, and Mark probably knows the answer better, but um, irrigation wells in Acton, I believe, have to meet drinking water standards so that we're not pumping up, um, you know, contaminated water and then spreading it on your front lawn. Uh, so, but other than that, I'm not sure. I guess I'd say in, in some ways that, you know, there's a minimum... Uh, production requirements for drinking water wells. I'm not sure that's true for irrigation wells, uh, but they're very similar. Mr. Economy? Yeah, I mean, obviously, we do require that the wells for irrigation meet the certain standards because we don't want to have the water being sprayed out where it could aerosol things or people drinking from it inadvertently or animals or children. So there are the similar standards for water quality, but you're right. The um, water production would not necessarily be the same. I mean, obviously you could have an intermittent irrigation well, it may not be as effective, but you could do that where with a pot of water supply, you need to have it be available in order to have a habitable residence. So I guess the question is, we're requiring all the wells here in Acton based on the current regulations to meet certain standards. I mean, and I think whether they, depending, not, irregardless of the use, they have to do that. They need to be safe, they need to be registered, they need to meet the minimum standards and requirements for that. So I would I say we, we do probably need to change that, but there are additional requirements for sanitization and drinking water quality. So I guess that goes back to the first question. Do we separate them or do we leave them just all part of Article 9 or we just break it up into sections in Article 9? I don't have a, an answer, but maybe uh, we can ask Cheryl to just give it a, a study as to what might make the... Th this regulation has obviously grown over time and it might be getting slightly unwieldy. So maybe there's a better way to, to organize it. Uh, Ms. Bassetta, I think you had a comment. And I'm sorry, Dr. Jacoby, did that answer your question? Well, it did, but I was just wondering why then is there a separate regulation for irrigation wells when it's basically the same as a potable water well? Well, I think the real distinction there is irrigation. Anybody can have an irrigation well. A potable water well, you're only supposed to have if you're not, uh, if you can't avail yourself of town water. So that, that's okay. one distinction. And um, I was just going to add that I, I believe irrigation wells have to be bedrock wells. Um, Good point. They can be shallow aquifer wells, which I know the Acton Water District wells are. Um, so that's another difference. Good point. And the testing frequency and parameters are different. Okay. 
Well, um, if I can just ask members, I mean, uh, we, we've had some general comments. I don't hear anybody objecting to the idea that we should uh, try to um, provide for geothermal wells in the regulation. It, it sounds like people might think that, uh, it, me included, that uh, we ought to look at how the this regulation is organized to make sure it's kind of a little cleaner and that people can find the regulations that apply to the situation that they want to do um, and easier. But um, other than that, I mean, it sounds like everyone is generally in favor of the idea. If that's not true, please speak now or wait until the next meeting. Okay. Charles, I apologize to put more on your plate, but I don't think there's any incredible urgency to this, but if you could find an opportunity to bring it back, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, um, so do you want me to try to um, put the geothermal um, separate within this article nine and we'll get, take a look at that before we separate it further? Or do you want me just to take it out and do like a whole nother, like nine B as, as someone suggested? Yeah, I think, well, actually, I think what I was, I sort of came to, and I think what Mark was suggesting is maybe we just take a look at the whole structure of this regulation and see if it makes sense to keep it as one, because it all is relating to wells. Um, and if so, is there a way to maybe organize it better that says every well, you know, must meet minimum drinking water standards for, I'm just making this as an example. And then, because that would be common to all wells, and then, you know, flow down from that, okay, here's a subset that would apply to irrigation wells, here's a subset that would apply to geothermal, something like that. Okay, I'll give that a shot and then bring it back to you to take a look. Yeah, or, you know, Evan is probably uh, looking to really get into something like this. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't mean me. I mean, I, I, we, it's one of us. Yeah, so that's fine. We can okay. do that. All right, thank you. I would suggest that we probably break it up to irrigation wells, uh, geothermal wells, and water supply for uh, drinking water, public, private, uh, public water supply wells, because some of the requirements are definitely going to be applicable to everybody, but not certain things like, you know, testing of the geothermal well once it's already <laughs> sealed up is not going to be feasible. So I kind of missed that when the first pass we were going through it. But when you start looking at the overall picture, I think we can make it a little uh, easier to use and understand it would be better. Okay. Okay. Well, if there's no uh, further discussion, any uh, comments from members of the public on this agenda item? No. Okay. In that case, uh, I'd like to move on. Um, the next item on the agenda is something I asked to be put on. It was based on a discussion I had with one, one of the members of the board um, who was concerned about seeing uh, town fields being used uh, by people that weren't practicing good COVID um, health practices. And, you know, he wanted to know what uh, we might be able to do to encourage people to be more mindful of uh, COVID um, practices. So a thought occurred to me and I wanted to propose this to the board. We have, uh, you know, various groups, um, soccer, baseball, uh, so forth, using the fields. Um, we have private companies using the fields to hold uh, like outdoor classes of like uh, yoga or Tai Chi or similar sort of things. Um, and that's all great. I mean, that's all, you know, it's beneficial for the citizens, it's beneficial for the businesses is what we have the fields for, but we are in a global pandemic. so. My suggestion was to say, well, you know, we're, we're glad you're using the town fields. We're uh, glad we're, they're getting beneficial use, but that carries a, an obligation or a responsibility to the people that have the permit. Uh, they, they do need to get a permit from, I believe it's the recreation department um, for the use of the town field. And we're, and we're going to shift the responsibility or, or place the responsibility, perhaps I think where it belongs, which is on the organization that's making use of the town field. So whether it's, you know, youth baseball or it's, uh, you know, a private company's um, exercise class, you know, they need to be responsible that their organization members are practicing the COVID um, safe practicing, safe practice uh, behaviors. And 
let them know that, you know, they're subject to uh, unannounced random inspections by either members of the health department or perhaps, you know, the recreation department or the police department or whomever. And if they observe, you know, failure to uh, practice COVID responsible behaviors that, you know, they'll be given a notice that says you, you need to uh, bring this in line. And, you know, if they uh, fail to bring it in line, then they lose the right to use the town field. And so this will mean that it's not a responsibility of the town to go and catch them doing something bad. And then this would place the responsibility on the user of the field to make sure that the uh, people using it are practicing their correct behaviors. And, and they can institute their own policies if they have members or, or clients that are refuse to follow the COVID policies and they can uh, not provide services to those clients or members um, because, you know, it's like, we're not going to lose the right to use the field because you won't wear a mask. That's my thought. And in, in a nutshell that we make that as a board of health, I guess, policy suggestion, however, and uh, perhaps that will ensure a higher rate of compliance and um, hopefully be a worthwhile uh, worthwhile practice. So members, what do you think? Ms. Bissetta. I think that makes sense. Um, I've seen uh, posts on social media over the past couple of weeks of, um, for the lack of a better term, uh, mask shaming of, you know, oh my God, I saw, you know, bunch of people playing softball, not wearing masks. Uh, um, and, you know, they incorrectly, you know, thought it was a, a school team. So, the, you know, if you follow the thread, there was, you know, somebody contacted the school, then the principal of the elementary school said, no, those aren't our people and it created a whole thing. But I think, um, you know, there is a sign posted at the Elm Street softball field that has, you know, please follow, you know, social distancing and all that. But I think if there's some sort of language in the uh, the permit application or whatever that um, these outside organizations receive from uh, the town, I think they need to be, you know, reiterate the importance of uh, proper uh, COVID behavior, where it's wearing masks, even though you're outside, but you know, you're doing an athletic um, activity that you're not guaranteed to be more than six feet away from somebody. Um, so I, I think that sounds like a reasonable approach. It, you know, takes the uh, onus a little bit off of our beleaguered and wonderful uh, health staff and, um, you know, puts it back on uh, the organizations that they need to take ownership of their members' behaviors. Okay, very good. Thank you. Other members? Mr. Conaby. Yeah, it sounds reasonable. I, I would expect that the permits could have you know, a, a condition that requires compliance with the COVID uh, requirements and that, you know, failure to follow. So maybe subject to, you know, fines, but also loss of the permit. And I think we should probably also put in there that if anyone is observed, not observing the proper requirements, they'll be asked to leave. Um, you know, and I maybe just put more posting at the different sites, encouraging a little bit more compliance. I mean, we've only got a couple more months, and I think a lot of the fields, unfortunately, will not be as active with snow. <laughs> but uh, I think we, we want people to get out and be active. We want to also to make sure that it's done properly and safely. And I just suggest putting it back on the individual groups and the permittees is a good first step. Um, and then I think maybe just mention it will be subject to uh, spot and uh, random inspection and enforcement, just so they realize that it, it is important and it will be monitored. And hopefully we can have everybody safe and enjoy the fields and get some outside activity where we still have a chance. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Anyone, are there are members, comments, questions, concerns? Well, Dr. Jacoby. Yes. Um, are the people given a sheet with regulations on it when they get the permission to use the field? 
Cheryl? Um, you know, they do have regulations on there, but I think we, uh, we'd have to add, I, I haven't seen the updated ones. So um, I, you know what, I, I would assume so because just to be allowed to play the sport, they needed to outline their plan to us. So um, we do have plans from some organizations. So uh, I don't think we're catching all the, the private people that are renting the facilities though. So uh, I'll speak with recreation and, and get it on there. I mean, the state did put out guidance um, that said for non-compliance, uh, the protocol should be um, first a, a verbal warning, second a written warning, um, third fines, and fourth cease and desist. So if you want, I can take a stab at, um, you know, writing up that policy and then submitting it to you guys. Um, or if you just think, if you just want me to um, get it done and send it to the, the leagues, I can do that as well. Yeah, I don't okay. think it has to be something that goes through the board. I think just the normal regulations that you've been posting all over town. But I also think that we need to really understand who the contact person is for each of these groups and make sure that they are aware that they are responsible and if there are issues then their permit will be canceled but just yeah, make sure I, I the do have a list. Understands. Yeah, yeah. I, I do have a list of every contact for um, the people that use the school fields as well as the town field so uh, at least the, or, the, the organization so I could get that out to them pretty quickly okay yeah I, I think that's Reasonable as Mark says, if we wait for another board meeting, they'll it'll be um, for the snowshoeing club. So, <laughs> okay, uh, um, yeah. yeah, and I and just as a, I have no objection to it, but I think fines might be difficult. I'm not sure what we would be fining them under, but certainly withdrawing the permit to use the town field is is fairly straightforward. So, and you know, it could be a verbal warning and then followed by a written warning. But I certainly think some sort of warning is appropriate but there has to be real consequences too, where they're going to ignore it. Okay. All right. Well, if no one objects, then um, I think uh, we're going to try to proceed down that path. Okay. So that was all I wanted to cover on that item. Um, so we have a set of minutes from September 14, which I did read, uh, unlike last time. So thank you to the members that read them last time and saved me the embarrassment. Um, I only had a, a very few comments. Uh, one was under the nursing service director updates. Toward the end of the paragraph, it said the board asked um, Ms. York about flu clinics. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It stated there are some facilities that don't require a doctor's note and Marlboro was mentioned. I just want to add the word hospital after Marlboro. Okay. Just to distinguish it from the town. And then um, on the BioBot sewage testing, I, I struggled with a sentence to add at the end, but basically my recollection is the board had no, no recommendation, meaning that we didn't object to it. You know, it would be interesting if the schools wanted to do it, that would be great, but we weren't going to suggest that they do it. Um, so basically it was, you know, the, the, I said that, you know, the board doesn't recommend or discourage. And I was like, eh, that sounds too wordy. Um, but the board, board took no action or recommendation on this matter. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. I was thinking took no action. Sounds like it's a petition, which it wasn't. Um, but that's fine. Has no recommendation. But that's all. Just uh, to sum up the the discussion about, because it sort of left it, hanging a little bit in my mind. It just never said, well, what did the board do? <laughs> I think the board is, the, the board did nothing but on purpose. <laughs> so. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, and that's, uh, that's it. That's all the comments I had. Other members, comments on the minutes? Nope. No. I'd almost. No that okay. almost sounded like a motion, Ms. Bissetta. Okay, well, I move that we accept the minutes as noted. Thank you. Very second. good. Dr. Jacoby is seconded. Um, 
All those in favor of accepting the minutes of September 14th with uh, uh, changes as noted, please say aye. 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 Any, any nay? Motion carries unanimously. All right, thank you. Um, I believe that brings us to the end of tonight's meeting, other than to say, when is our next meeting, Cheryl? Uh, October 19th, I think. Yes, October 19th. Okay. Um, members, any other comments, questions? I see Dr. Bill's already unmuted and I know what he's thinking. <laughs> I, can, I can read minds, just saying. <laughs> uh, yes, I'd like to make a motion. <laughs> please do. I make a motion the meeting be adjourned. Now that motion. we've completed our business. Thank you, Dr. Bill. A motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Very good, Dr. Jacoby. A motion made and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Motion carries unanimously. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all again. Um, we're we're getting. Uh, I'll say we're getting to into a rhythm on this where um, we're making difficult decisions and I think making them well. So, again, thank you all for your time and your consideration and and. Uh, by golly, I think we might get through this. So I will. Well, thank you, Bill, for all your efforts. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you to the whole board, actually. Thank you. Guys, you. you know, we've been meeting a lot. You're doing a great job. And, and we've, you've had to make some really tough decisions. So I, I get it. And I appreciate your help. So thank you for me as well in my department. Thank you all. And I guess we'll speak on the 19th. All right. Have a good night. Thank All you. Right. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone.